Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Eric Geiser. I'm here today with uh, Joshua Christiana. Uh, we will be presenting, sorry about the delay, uh, we moved into some new offices and we have some new equipment and we are uh, learning it as we go. So we're, and we do see that a lot of you are not, a, we're not able to hear us. So uh, hopefully that has been uh, resolved. Um, we're going to get going. We have a, a pretty large agenda. We will get done within an hour. Uh, a couple of things I want to go over before we get into the content of uh, the presentation. Uh, first, we are recording today's presentation. It will be available uh, after today. We will send a link uh, so that people can uh, make reference to it after the presentation is completed. Uh, we're also going to be referencing some new materials. Uh, we have a new quality improvement. Uh, manual that we will be distributing uh, following this webinar. That will also be uh, distributed uh, to all the chapters along with some uh, reporting uh, documents and some updated uh, documents that we plan to use in the upcoming year. Uh, for today's presentation, everyone is muted. Uh, this prevents uh, feedback on the lines. Uh, if you do have a question, please feel free to use the question a box or the chat box and we will stop periodically and attempt uh, to answer them. Uh, you can also reach uh, either me or Josh by telephone or email after the presentation. Uh, that's another option for you as well. Uh, so that being said, we will get right into the material. Okay, and Josh, want to take it from here? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Christian. I'm the Director for Quality Improvement and Compliance uh, at NYSERC, as Eric mentioned. Um, and something that we always like to tell uh, individuals uh, involved in quality improvement activities is that the numbers matter sometimes. Um, and as you can see on this slide, that uh, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. And the real idea here is that sometimes it's difficult to measure what is important. And you can count things that are not always important. So it's really critical to be selective in what you're going to collect in terms of data. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, throughout this presentation. So some things we're going to discuss today, uh, we're going to do an introduction into our quality improvement program, a little bit about how we got here. Uh, we'll give you a status report on our quality program, some of the updates and things that have been happening, uh, the changes that are coming in this year, uh, things that we've developed, as Eric mentioned, the manual, a few other items. Uh, we're going to talk about pulling it all together, uh, putting the quality improvement process and best practices in use of quality data, uh, putting those together uh, to get your quality program. And then we're going to conclude with the next steps uh, both short-term and long-term goals for the quality improvement uh, process. So there were some major quality achievements that have happened since we began this process. In 2014, uh, NYSARC merged the Compliance and Quality Committees into the Joint Committee on Quality and Corporate Compliance. Uh, this was done because uh, a lot of the compliance activities and the quality activities overlapped. A lot of the membership overlapped. Uh, really, this was uh, a way to make some of the work more efficient uh, and to pull things together. Uh, all the chapters submitted quality improvement plans in the fall of 2014. Uh, 48 chapters and one uh, DC submitted to NYSARC. Uh, all of those quality improvement plans were approved uh, by the Quality Standards Professional Work Group. And from that, uh, 10 quality metrics were identified uh, out of the review of those plans. Uh, following this, uh, all the chapters ended up submitting their quality data to the state office, uh, which was ultimately reviewed by the work group. And following that, uh, we ended up releasing a quality dashboard. Now, the quality dashboard uh, was de-identified data. Uh, basically, it was the metrics uh, based on chapter budget size. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, in later slides and some changes that are coming with that. We then sent the identified data, uh, and that was in support uh, by the EDA. Uh, we felt that giving that information out would help improve the transparency of what we were doing and 
kind of give everyone an understanding of where they might uh, be in terms of their, their quality versus other, other chapters. We did collect feedback uh, on the process, which we'll look at that a little bit. And then ultimately that fed into the metrics being refined and added. Uh, we, we are going to be looking at adding a couple metrics and uh, changing some of the definitions. A little, whoops. A little bit about CQL uh, and the progress that we've made uh, in the last few years. As of uh, February, uh, 32 chapters were accredited. Uh, this is a big achievement, uh, and we have many chapters still going through the process. Uh, we do hope that a majority of the chapters, if not all, are interested in becoming accredited. We did complete a survey uh, in October. Uh, to determine, or prior to October actually, we completed a survey to determine where chapters were in the process. Uh, if they felt that they wanted to become accredited, if they were going to be using trainers, interviewers, what level of uh, involvement that they wanted. Uh, following that in October, we actually uh, reached an agreement with CQL uh, that resulted in discounts for all accreditation and reaccreditation fees uh, that would start in 2016. Uh, it also allowed for the sharing of interviewers and trainers without restrictions. Uh, this is something that uh, is exclusive to NYSARC. It was a, a pretty good achievement for us to get uh, CQL to come along with us, uh, and it, it does have a number of benefits. And then most recently in February, uh, we reached a training agreement with CQL that provided us with a greater deal of options for uh, maintaining certification for trainers. Uh, and that was sent out in a memo in February, and it really leads to a reduction in some of the requirements to maintain your certification as a trainer. Um, so, a couple things with CQL as far as what's coming up. Uh, we do have a long-term goal of getting uh, all of the chapters accredited and being the first organization to do so. That would be a, a big milestone for us. Uh, we also would like to begin to explore looking at comparing the POMS data for the 32 accredited chapters. If I can, out, let me just jump in and explain what this means. Um, one of the things that we reached with CQL was an agreement that upon our request, they would run a comparative data analysis on reliable POMS uh, data that was submitted. So. Uh, it gives us yet another tool as more and more chapters become accredited and start to submit that data to CQL. It gives us another tool on which to kind of measure ourselves, see where we compare, compare to others in the organization who are doing the same thing, and also start to look at how we compare to all other providers that are in the CQL network. Uh, and one of the bold things that we would like to do uh, is we would like to start to look at the relationship between CQL accreditation to our own metrics and then really answering the question of does CQL accreditation result in better, better quality indicator numbers? So what is the impact that uh, the accreditation has on a chapter um, and then maybe comparing some chapters that are not accredited and some that are and, and seeing what that reveals. Uh, the form, the, the screen that's up now uh, shows you the quality indicators form that was sent out uh, to the chapters. Uh, this is what was used to report the metrics back to state office. Uh, and you will uh, see an updated version of this for this year, and we'll continue to use this form going forward. As I mentioned prior, uh, we, did some, we did release a quality indicator dashboard uh, with the 10 metrics, and you can see there that uh, the information is stratified by the chapter size, the budget size, uh, and then we, after that, released uh, the identified information. But on the left is the metrics, and they cover three general areas, uh, programming, surveys, and incidents. As I mentioned earlier, we did uh, get feedback from the chapters, and we do understand that the quality initiative is new, and we're continuing to look at ways that we can improve it. A lot of that uh, comes back to the work group so that we can discuss sort of the things that have worked, the things that haven't worked. Uh, we do go around and we've done some uh, at, 
at the chapters, we've done some presentations. We've collected information back from different executive directors and COOs and uh, different groups. And uh, after we did that, uh, we pulled it all together and we kind of refined some of the information for this year. The Quality Standards Professional Work Group reviewed the program and the 2014 data. And then, as I mentioned, the feedback resulted in modifications. And we learned that the chapters also need more guidance on what to do with the data when they receive it. And we hope that we're going to be able to answer what you do with the data once you have it. And Eric's going to talk a little bit about that later on. So there are some changes this year. Uh, one of the big ones is the Quality Improvement Manual. Uh, the work group, Eric, myself, uh, all worked together to kind of develop uh, what would be in this manual. And essentially, the manual contains all the tools, the forms that you will use for a program. And the hope is that it will allow for better uh, understanding uh, and distribution of the, the metrics. So, Eric, if you want to pull up the manual. Sure. Let's hope this hyperlink works. Looks like it's not going to allow us to hyperlink uh, today. Um, but what we can tell you about the Quality Improvement Manual, uh, and you will be receiving a copy of this after uh, the presentation, it basically puts all the materials together in one place for you. Uh, so we have resolutions, we have some policies, we have some guidance uh, that we have done over the last two years, uh, but we realize they're all in separate documents. Uh, this is a PDF that has a hyperlink uh, table of contents, which will allow you to go directly to uh, the section of the manual. Uh, we actually have some uh, interesting tools in the manual. One is a crosswalk between uh, CQL uh, and uh, the quality measures that we use here uh, that we think will be helpful. Uh, the other are some exploratory questions that we would ask that you apply uh, to the data when you receive the results back. Uh, so you can begin to do some investigation into why your numbers are what they are and why you, what things you can do to try to improve those things. Um, so there's a lot of helpful things in the manual. Uh, you'll be getting a copy of it, and we think it's going to really benefit everyone. So uh, during the first phase of the quality improvement uh, plan rollout, the uh, original resolution that was passed required annually a copy of the Quality Improvement Plan with board resolution to be submitted to NYSARC. Uh, now, we've made a change to this, and the new resolution allows for the data to be, and the Quality Improvement Plan be submitted by each chapter uh, in accordance with the uh, terms issued by the Joint Committee. And essentially what that means is that uh, the chapters will not have to submit the full Quality Improvement Plan annually, but rather submit an attestation form that their chapter board has reviewed and signed off on. And we're going to look at that form in a second. Uh, but the general goal here was to reduce the staff time spent on quality improvement activities and link up the submission of the data and the quality improvement uh, plan at the, at the station the board review uh, to put them together. And that will go in effect following this webinar. This is the form. Uh, I did send this out uh, probably maybe a month, two months ago uh, for everyone to kind of take a peek at. It, again, it's not due until after this, uh, until this webinar is complete and uh, we'll send out the form again and some other information. But you can see there's three main areas, uh, general chapter, chapter information, some just general demographic information there. The second part is the part that you'll spend most of the time on, which is identifying changes to the quality improvement plan that have occurred since the last time that the board reviewed it. And what we're looking for is significant quality changes to the plan. So if you have become accredited, you know, we'd like to know that. Uh, if you've changed significantly some a way that you're measuring your metrics or collecting your, me your metrics, if you've gotten an electronic health record started up and that's how you're, you know, collecting your data. Uh, if you've implemented a new quality program, we'd like to know that. So any significant changes to your quality program and your plan should be listed in there. And then the third section is the state office review where we'll take a look at it. Uh, we will, of course, offer you feedback on any of the changes if we have questions. Uh, so this will be completed uh, once a year. 
and everything that we we do in terms of these forms um, is, I mean, we understand the huge administrative burden that the chapters have uh, with reporting and uh, you know filling out various forms and all the requirements that you you have uh, facing you. Uh, we vet all of these things through our quality standards professional work group. This form uh, should probably just take a minute or two to complete. It should not take that long. Um, it's going to be submitted the same time as your data, which is also uh, data that you are already collecting for the most part for your required Part 624 uh, regulatory uh, incident review metrics. So again, everything we're doing is is with the, I guess, consideration of the work you're already doing at the chapter, and we don't want to reinvent the wheel or duplicate efforts. Now, there is a sample version of this that, that also will be sent with it uh, so that you can see what we're talking about. And again, the, that section two really isn't, it won't be that broad of a, of a section. So the schedule uh, for the quality improvement plan and the quality data reporting, it will be in late spring of each year. We're going to ask the chapters to submit uh, the annual quality improvement plan, or the, excuse me, the attestation sheet that we just looked at, as well as the previous year's data. So for this round, we'll be looking at May 31st as the date that we'll need all of that information in. And then after that, we're going to analyze all of that information, and then we will provide feedback uh, by the summertime, sometime in the summer uh, of each year. So a couple important things. Uh, we have made some changes uh, to the metrics, uh, the data dictionary, and the way that we're doing data analysis. So one of the main things that we, we discussed is the stratification. And at this point, we've changed the stratification to be done by using the number of individuals served as opposed to the chapter budget size or stratifying by budget size. Uh, and we really believe that this will make the information more person-centered and really more meaningful. Uh, we've eliminated the pending investigations data metric, uh, really because that was sort of telling us essentially what investigations were, were overdue or not met the closure date. But we really, as I mentioned from that first slide, it's not always necessary that we collect all pieces of data. Uh, we are going to include capturing the number of ICS and IRAs. And a big uh, point to note here is that for submission of this data, you're going to want to use the pre-January 1st, 2016 Part 624 definitions uh, because they did change, uh, but we're interested in the information that is related to incidents before that. That means that the next round that you do uh, come 2017 uh, will be based on the 2016 regulations. The SOD metric has been clarified to explicitly include OFPC surveys because there was a little bit of confusion there. Uh, the, we have combined serious and minor notable occurrences into just notable occurrences, so we condensed it. We are also looking for uh, information on other mistreatment incidents. What we're looking for is whether you have substantiated, confirmed, founded. Uh, now, really, that's just uh, the terminology that we're using. Uh, what we mean is essentially if you determine that the other, the other mistreatment has occurred or it did not occur and in whatever term that you use, uh, but we're looking for, for that. We're also going to be collecting on the number of individuals served uh, aging between 18 and 62, and this will really feed into the employment data that we're looking at. Uh, competitive, competitively employed data related to working age recipients and vocational services provided by the chapters is what we're going to be looking for. Uh, we've also added a key indicator, staff turnover. And this was based on discussion with the work group, uh, some of our presentations we did out in the field when we went out to the chapters. And uh, we really thought that uh, staff turnover is a key indicator for the quality and the health of the chapter. So <clears throat> a key thing to look at here is that we're changing the definition, or we're, we're refining the definition, changing the definitions for things. And this one, we have a very um, 
detailed definition that excludes promotional opportunities, transfers, contractors, in turn, uh, relief staff, substitutes, and per diem staff. So when you're collecting that data, you're not going to be including those parties. And I just want to uh, give some credit where credit is due. Um, this is not something that NYSARC did independently. Uh, this is a metric that the Finger Lakes Collaborative uh, developed, uh, and it's something that we uh, borrowed from them. Uh, it's been very helpful to those chapters. Uh, and like Josh said, again, we feel there's a direct correlation between uh, consistency in staff and the knowledge of the people that we serve and the quality of services that are being provided. We are going to be supplying the quality indicator formulas, and you can see on the screen there that uh, this is not a formula that Eric and I use. That's not one of them. Yeah, we are not mathematicians, so that's not something we can do. Uh, but uh, we are going to give you the formulas, and they will look like this. Uh, this is actually the formulas, and as I mentioned earlier, there are the three general categories here, the programming, SOGs, programs, and incidents, and then all the formulas that we use to calculate a rate uh, assigned to the quality metric. So for those of you that are asking, like, you see P2, P1, P10, P4, where are these coming from? The data reporting form that we ask you to complete each year, each of those has a code assigned to it, um, and the, these are the, uh, the data entries from that form. Uh, so you'll be able to run your own numbers and see where you stand long before uh, we provide feedback to all the organizations at once. So uh, we just want you to be aware of how we are calculating the rates and percentages that we are assessing quality on. Okay, I'm going to uh, take over now for a little bit. Uh, I don't see that we have any questions. Again, if you do have questions, feel free to enter that information into the chat box and we'll do our best uh, to uh, answer it. One of the big areas of feedback that we received was that there were a lot of chapters struggling with the information uh, that we provided. We provided a lot. Uh, it was a, maybe even a little overwhelming. Uh, but as we went out to our regional compliance meetings uh, and our quality meetings, we found that the staff uh, were really struggling with, okay, now that we have these things, uh, how do we use them? How do we how do we push quality forward uh, with all this data that you've provided us? So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we see you would best best be able to use this information. A couple of general principles about this entire program. Okay, obviously the program is intended to push quality into the forefront and make it a priority for all of the people that we serve. It can't be done unless there is a, a buy-in at the top, and that, that buy-in has to happen both at the board level and also the executive leadership level. Uh, if they're not on board, if they don't support the efforts, uh, most likely your quality efforts are not going to be very successful. One of the key problems that we are finding, unfortunately, I think we're all kind of, um, it's ingrained that we kind of look at these things like a report card. It's very hard to look at this data as a report card, and we'll talk about why that is. Uh, we understand why uh, you might look at it that way, but uh, it's most beneficial when you look at your own data uh, over a period of time uh, to assess your progress as a chapter. There's just too many uh, different characteristics between the different chapters uh, to draw you know, hard comparisons. The other piece of this is that this is an ongoing process. There's no beginning or end. It's continuous. It's not like you just uh, you know, write up your quality improvement plan and you're good to go for the next decade. That is not the intent. Uh, this is a living, breathing process. The document should be updated. Uh, it should be updated based on data that you are receiving back uh, from state office. Um, and it should be integrated into all the things that you are doing. Um, Another key takeaway is that every chapter be, should be striving to improve. Now, when we release the identified data to the chapters, you know, obviously there's, there's chapters that are performing at a higher level or, or, or well above the average. There's chapters that are uh, not performing above, so they're performing below the average. Um, the fact is that when it comes to quality, there really are no 
benchmarks for the entire field. So it's hard for us to say that just because you're at the top of the list, uh, you're doing everything well. The, the fact of the matter is all chapters, whether you're at the top of the list or the bottom of the list, all chapters should be striving to improve their numbers uh, annually uh, and, and getting better. And that will drive all of the other chapters forward. Okay. The other piece of it that you need to recognize, too, is, is bang for your buck. Um, let's take employment, uh, competitive employment, for example. Uh, let's say you, you come up at the, the top of the list for competitive employment, but the way you did that was by spending a couple of million dollars to create businesses to employ some people that, uh, that consistently lose money. Obviously, that doesn't make a lot of sense, and that's not a good use of your resources. So, you know, it's all about balance. In the interest of some transparency, there are some limitations to this program. Uh, there is really no definition of quality that currently exists in the field. We're kind of doing this on the fly as we as we go along. OPWDD has not identified anything. Um, there are no national uh, quality definitions that currently exist. Uh, so we're taking our best shot at it, uh, and it's going to continue to evolve just like your local Q quality programs are going to continue to evolve. There are different characteristics and populations and services at each chapter that makes making comparisons between chapters very, very difficult despite the urge to do so. Uh, that's not really the intent. The intent is to identify individual chapters that are performing above the average uh, and assisting chapters that are below the average and starting a dialogue between those two groups. Again, metrics don't assess efficiency, so if it's costing you $2 million to get your, your numbers up in one area, that may not be the best use of funds. Now, if you're going to staff your house with double the number of staff to reduce uh, the number of incidents that are occurring, again, not the best uh, way to address uh, incidents occurring at the chapter. Garbage in, garbage out is an auditing term, but we are reliant on the data that you provide to us. Uh, so if you provide us with valid, accurate data, we're able to give you valid, accurate rates and percentages back out. If the numbers are not right uh, or there's a misunderstanding about what we're asking for, obviously the data that we're going to uh, provide back to you is not going to be accurate. The other thing that we really haven't done yet is identify the vital few. And what I mean by vital few are, you know, we, we're, we collected uh, 10, 10 uh, separate metrics for last year. This year there's a few more. Um, I'm not so sure that all of those metrics really tell a story of, of what is quality and what isn't quality. I think there are a few metrics that uh, provide a, a, a better understanding of quality uh, and that's something we're going to struggle with uh, as we move forward. Uh, but our goal is to streamline the information that we're feeding back to you to just that information that really tells uh, a picture of, of quality uh, at the provider chapter level. So misunderstandings that exist, again, the report card, um, how did my chapter do compared to this chapter? Um, is very difficult uh, to do. The example I always use are death cases, and we know, you know, certain chapters, you know, our Chautauqua chapter, our New York City chapter, our Lexington chapter, they have ICFs with some very medically complex populations. We expect that they're going to have more deaths. That is not a, in any way, a, a reflection of the quality of services uh, that they provide at those chapters, and that we have to look at that information and determine whether those types of metrics are part of the vital few, whether they really do tell us anything about quality. So we're going to be doing that going forward. And then the other limitation is that we really don't have any control over the definitions and uh, categories that are changing as a result of the Justice Center in 2013 and as a result of you know um, updates uh, such as the January 1st uh, definitions and changes uh, in the regulations on incident management. I'm not going to read this slide to you. I, I, I just want to touch on what is a benchmark versus what is an average. 
when we provide the dashboard back to the chapters, we're really providing you the average for our organization. And there is a difference. Benchmarks are goals to aim for. Uh, most commonly, benchmarks are things that you know a, a profession identifies as a best practice or an exemplary practice. Uh, averages are the, the mean uh, of how our organization is performing. So uh, we don't have uh, any benchmarks uh, at this time or national benchmarks to compare ourselves to. So we are using at this time averages to determine whether you are above average or below average relative to the other chapters. Okay? But we should all be shooting to improve our numbers as individual chapters and as an organization going forward. So our averages should improve over time if our quality program is effective. All right. In terms of how does this all work as a model, um, the PDCA model plan, do, check, and action is something that the healthcare community has adopted uh, as its quality improvement cycle, if you will. Uh, Edward Deming and Walter Schuer in the 1930s came up with the model. Uh, essentially, there's a, there's a number of different names uh, that have been applied to this type of model. Uh, total quality management, continuous quality improvement, uh, the PDCA model, all of these things are very close to one another. Uh, but the big takeaway is that there is no end and there's no beginning. It's an ongoing process uh, and it's something that you have to live as a chapter in order to make sure that uh, quality occurs. So here is the model with a little more detail on each section in terms of what the expectations would be. And we'll talk about how this relates to our quality improvement uh, plans and, and which, which uh, components are in which sections. Uh, but essentially in the plan section, you're going to be doing the following types of activities. You're going to be defining the issue the problem or the concern, you're going to be setting priorities, you're going to be assigning staff responsibilities, you're going to be looking at the desired outcomes that you want to achieve, you're going to be identifying targets and goals that you want to reach, uh, and you're going to be establishing time frames and resources for the project. In the do section, you're going to actually implement the project as designed. Let me roll back one sec to the plan section. So the plan section would, would be more or less where you would be developing your quality improvement uh, plan. Okay, The do section where you would implement the project as designed, you would engage all levels of the organization, you would hold staff accountable for deliverables, and you would monitor progress. That would be actually implementing all the aspects of the quality improvement plan that your chapter has developed. The check component would include such activities as collecting and analyzing data and trends, determining impact and lessons learned, identifying process improvements, and communicating and reporting findings. In terms of NYSARC, this happens at two levels. It happens from state office when we look at all of the uh, data uh, in aggregate and we feed it back to the chapters. And then it should be happening at the chapter level where you're looking at your specific data and you are working with your uh, boards and your leadership to identify goals for the following year. The final step is act, okay? And that would include items such as determining how to sustain improvements and using what is learned to identify new improvements to begin improvements to begin the cycle again. All right. So in the act stage, you would be taking the results from the previous year, you would be analyzing those results, you would be re-establishing goals, and you would be uh, 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 incorporating changes into your quality improvement plan for the following year. And this is how it plays out visually. So uh, each of the circles reflects uh, one of the tasks for quality improvement and the overlay is the PDCA cycle. Uh, and you can see that it's just, an, it's just a, an ongoing cycle with no end and no beginning. Some roles, I think, for just some level setting. I think there's been some confusion over, you know, 
this role of state office and the role of the chapter. Um, so state office, what we are doing here is, you know, obviously we established a quality framework. Uh, we set and refine the quality guidelines, metrics, and indicators. We come up with the definitions. We work to identify metrics that we think tell us something about the quality of services that are being provided. We collect all that data from the chapters. We analyze that data. We report it back to you. Uh, and we assist chapters that may want to make improvements in, in a number of different areas uh, with communicating. We facilitate communication with those chapters that are doing really well in certain areas. The chapter role is slightly different, but it's more in line with some of the charts that I showed before in terms of the uh, PDCA cycle. So you're going to be developing your QIP. You're going to be submitting your data to state office on an annual basis. Once we give you back the uh, metrics and the averages, uh, you're going to be reviewing those metrics with management. You're going to be reviewing those metrics with your board as well. You as an organization are going to identify what areas you feel you need to improve on. You're going to identify mechanisms or methods to make those improvements. You're going to incorporate those right back into your quality improvement plan. And then on a broader level, uh, you're also going to be providing us feedback uh, here at State Office on the quality program, on ways we can improve, uh, on ways that you think quality can be better measured. Uh, because just like you, uh, uh, our quality improvement program here at the state level is an ongoing process uh, that with no, starts and no start and no beginning. So we're also striving to make improvements uh, as we move along. Okay, so how, how do you review the data? So you get these fancy charts back. Uh, it has a lot of averages on there. You also get the identified chapter, which shows all 48 chapters and where you fall relative to uh, the averages for the organization. Well, you're going to use your dashboard to identify opportunities for improvement. You are going to compare your scores to others to see not necessarily you know, how you grade compared to the others. Uh, but to identify some chapters that may be doing things better than others. Um, uh, there are some chapters I, I can remember specifically, I believe in terms of competitive employment. Uh, one of our chapters, the uh, Allegheny chapter, uh, scored you know, the highest in that particular indicator. Uh, and you know, as we have uh, visited chapters throughout the state, they, they have some very unique and innovative um, employment uh, programs there. So it's certainly something that all of our chapters can learn from. And those are the types of dialogue that I think we need to start to foster more. Uh, we need to start asking the question of why. Why are, why are our numbers what they are? And there can be lots of reasons for that. Uh, but we need to start asking the questions of why our numbers may be lower or higher than the average and uh, determine whether or not that is in line with uh, what our goals are in terms of, of those particular indicators. All of this, of course, is dependent on analyzing trends and patterns, and that's really the key in, in all of this. Uh, so once you have the data back and you identify there's areas you want to improve on, you really need to dig into the data and find out, or at least do some sort of investigative work to some extent to find out why your numbers are what they are. Uh, this will help you start to understand where there may be opportunities. It will also help you uh, identify what fixes, adjustments, or systemic improvements you need to put into place uh, to ensure that your numbers continue to improve. Some best practices in the use of quality data. Um, you really need to review the data and discuss the chapter goals. Okay, on an ongoing basis, so we don't just send this to you and expect you to, to go into a file. We really expect the chapters to look at the data, compare it to your own chapter's data, uh, and have dialogue about it. it. This should also involve your board. Okay, and some of our chapters have come up with some pretty unique ways for having that dialogue with, with the board. The third bullet um, is, you know, you want to use uh, your current quality improvement efforts that are already in place. And maybe Josh, if you want to talk a little bit about 
the CQL tie into this? Sure. Uh, Eric mentioned earlier that the manual includes a crosswalk of the quality indicators to the CQL uh, basic assurances. And uh, what we are encouraging chapters to do is to take the efforts that they're already, they're already doing with their basic assurance monitoring or their person-centered excellence plans uh, and not to essentially recreate the wheel with your uh, quality improvement plan that you're submitting to NYSAR, but rather to look at what you're doing in the basic assurances and the person-centered excellence plans and link them up with your quality improvement plan. Uh, essentially what, what I'm saying is that uh, we really want you to get credit for the work that you're doing. Uh, you know, there's no sense in really submitting two quality improvement plans if you're already involved in quality improvement activities through CQL. Uh, you know, make sure that you report on those in your, in your quality improvement plan and submit that to us so we can see what you're doing. Okay, thanks. Um, so at best practices, obviously as we get more data and we start to have some historical data, we can start to establish some benchmarks in terms of our indicators. But right now, we're really focusing in on increasing our averages, uh, bettering our figures, both on an individual chapter basis and as an organization. Uh, it's going to be hard to determine this year because a lot of the uh, categories in terms of incident management have changed. So it's not really comparing apples to apples. But that is the goal long term as things begin to stabilize. Okay, some exploratory questions. These questions are included in the manual, which we will be distributing either maybe tomorrow or a Monday. Uh, but these are some general questions that I would recommend that each chapter ask itself uh, when, they're, when they receive their data back. And let's say there's a, an area of concern. You, let's say you score much lower than the average in one particular metric. Uh, you would want to dig into that difference and try to understand it. These are some questions that might help you uh, identify why your data figures are lower uh, than the averages. Okay, I'm not going to read them to you. They are available to you, but essentially it becomes kind of a mini investigation, if you will. Uh, try to understand why your numbers are what they are. It can be lots of different reasons, uh, but these types of questions will help foster that sort of inquiry. Let's walk through now a case example using one of our indicators, which is injuries to employees. So the first item that you're going to do when we provide back data to you on all of these metrics is you are going to start to look at that data both from an intra and inter chapter comparison. You're going to be looking at how you compare relative to the other chapters in the organization and the averages that are contained on our dashboard. I think more importantly, though, you're also going to be looking at intra-chapter, and that's from year to year, how are you doing as a chapter to improve your numbers. That is going to be the more valid and reliable uh, figure on which to base whether you're making improvement or not uh, until we establish some historical data, though, we're, we're going to have to rely on kind of a combination of both intra and inter uh, chapter comparison. Some of our more inventive chapters actually took the dashboard that we distributed. And so we broke it down small, medium, and large, and, and our total averages. They actually took our dashboard and they added another row uh, and put their specific chapter in and their numbers, they then would bring this to their board and to their leadership just to get some reference and, and a framing, if you will, of uh, how their numbers compared to uh, the strat stratifications uh, of the data that we have established. Okay. So it leads to questions. For Smith County ARC, in our example, uh, why, why, are this, why are this chapter's numbers higher than others? What is going on? Can someone explain this? Okay, so I would encourage you to use our dashboard and take your specific numbers and, and actually foster that dialogue. That will, of course, lead us to the analysis for the injuries to employees uh, metric. So using those exploratory questions, you're going to do some thoughtful analysis 
of your data and why it is uh, what it is compared to others. You're going to be examining all the factors that may be contributing to the difference. Um, you need to start assessing whether reports are being reviewed for trends and corrective actions. Okay? So, for example, uh, the type of injuries that are happening could be a clue. But let's say you see an increase in a lot of back injuries. You know, perhaps uh, additional training or supports need to be provided for safe patient handling. Uh, it could be certain locations. It could be certain shifts. It could be certain categories. Obviously, if your maintenance workers are getting injured at a higher rate versus your DSPs, that tells us something about that department and things that we may need to put into place to correct that situation. Similarly, you know, are these injuries occurring with the same individuals that we serve? That could also suggest perhaps understaffing, perhaps undertraining. Again, opportunities may, may become available. So some of the questions that that may lead to are, you know, have you developed a sufficient staffing plan uh, that includes all funded positions? Uh, and it could raise questions about training uh, for employees on workplace safety. Uh, responding to and reporting of injuries. In this case example that we're outlining here, here's uh, just you know some possible reasons why your injury rate might be uh, higher than the average. Okay, so as you start to dig into the data, you might determine that your staff injuries are affecting your DSPs uh, uh, predominantly uh, more than others. Uh, that the issues seem to be isolated to just a few of your houses, that as you dig deeper into the data, that the injuries seem to be occurring on your afternoon shift, okay? And the timing of these are suggesting that it actually seems to have something to do with transitional times. So as people are returning from a day program and getting back to the residential setting, uh, there may be some behavioral outbursts or behavioral challenges, okay? So, again, as you dig in, it, you will start to identify those areas that you think you can make some changes and that should have uh, a positive impact on your numbers, okay? So things like, uh, do you need more staff? Uh, do you need additional training? Are there certain individuals this seems to be happening with? Uh, so perhaps if there are, uh, you're going to want to put in uh, different behavioral approaches or non-physical intervention approaches to address uh, those particular individuals. Okay. And the other thing that you have to your benefit is uh, if it's just isolated to a few of your programs, you have other programs where you're not having these types of injuries and you're going to want to learn from those programs on what is working uh, and why it's working. And lastly, discuss and apply. Okay, so you're going to bring your analysis and your theories that evolve out of your quote unquote investigation to your data. Uh, and you're going to bring it to your leadership and board for discussion. Um, based on that, your board and your leadership should be identifying goals for the next year, uh, as well as identifying or coming up with a variety of solutions and options to assist you where you want to see improvement. Once you have these things, you need to build these right back into your quality improvement plan. Okay, the, and that's the plan that the board approves, and that's the uh, QIP attestation form that you'll be completing for state office. So again, every year that plan really should be changing. It doesn't have to change significantly, but it should change to reflect uh, the results of your data relative to the other chapters in the field. At that point, you're going to implement the revised chapter QIP. And finally, you know, once all that stuff is implemented, you're going to want to remeasure uh, to determine whether or not you have made improvement uh, as a chapter. Again, it kind of brings everything full circle, uh, no pun intended, but um, it really is an ongoing circle. Uh, we are involved in uh, developing uh, and assisting you in all of these steps as we move along. Um, right now, I would say we're kind of at that red circle area where we have our data back and now uh, you are in the process of developing your goals, your quality goals for next year 
uh, and you should be in the process of developing your QIP revisions. Uh, and then onward and upward we go uh, to hopefully improve quality across the board. Okay, so some next steps. What do you do now? All right, so following this presentation, we're going to be rolling out our 2015 data reporting form. It has a few new fields on there, but again, we don't think this should be an additional burden because you're already collecting the vast majority of the information for your Part 624 reviews. The rest of the data elements will come out of your HR department. Again, most of these things are things you are already collecting. It's just a matter of bringing it all together, getting it down on paper, and sending it to either Josh or me. We will be sending out our quality manual, uh, a, a separate QIP attestation form, and a quality data reporting form in the next few days. Okay. The manual has all of these forms in it, but uh, we will provide it to you separately so that you can fill it out electronically if you're so inclined. Um, the attestation and the data reporting will be due on May 31st, 2016, and then it's going to take us, uh, I would say, at least a month, six weeks, to really dig into the data, come up with all the, uh, the rates and ratios, uh, and hopefully provide that back to you in the middle of the summer. We will be going over this process in more detail at our regional quality and compliance meetings, which will be occurring in early May. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you do have questions or concerns, we can certainly address them at that time. Uh, and notice of those meetings will be going out uh, in the next week or two. Long-term uh, goals for our program is as we identify the consistent high performers, uh, we want to bring them in to have discussions uh, so that other chapters can learn from what they're doing. And that'll be part, I think, of uh, Bakar's ongoing webinar series, uh, learning, you know, learning by webinar uh, from one another. Uh, we will be working on developing a web-based portal for reporting your quality data. We will be identifying the vital few indicators. Those are the indicators who, that we think really tell us something about quality. And we will be eliminating certain indicators that we don't think are providing uh, much clarity on that issue. Uh, we hope long term to establish some type of scoring capability. So similar to what's being done on the financial sustainability side, we would love to have some scoring relative to quality. Again, that's all dependent, of course, on being able to identify those indicators that really uh, capture uh, a, a quality picture. And we want to continue to build on the CQL success. As Josh mentioned, we have 32 chapters that are accredited. As more chapters become accredited and more chapters start to submit data to CQL, that's going to give us yet another pool of information and data from which we can start to compare and contrast ourselves and identify chapters that are doing things perhaps better than others, uh, again, fostering learning for the organization. Okay, uh, we've come to the end of the presentation. It's just after five. I apologize for going over a few minutes. There are no questions that are presently in our chat box. If I'll, I'll give just a, a few minutes to see if anyone wants to type anything in. Okay, let's see. Bear with us, we're just reviewing the questions that came in. Looks like someone's raising uh, that the new training requirements for CQL, there may have been uh, some inconsistency in the agreement that we reached that might have been more stringent than the second option. Um, 
we will check into that and we will let you know. We'll review the uh, three options that CQL is per, uh, currently uh, allowing us to use for trainer certification. Okay, there's a couple of comments and some feedback, but I don't see any other questions. Ah, last question. Will the presentation be available on YouTube? Yes. Uh, after the presentation, we will uh, have an electronic copy posted on YouTube, and we will send that link, as well as all of the materials for the presentation, to everyone in the next day or two. So everyone will be able to uh, view it over and over. All right. I want to thank everyone for uh, spending an hour with us. We uh, hope that we answered some questions and gave you some good uh, information today. And both Josh and I are available to you by email or telephone or at the Regional Quality and Compliance meetings in May. Thank you very much and enjoy St. Patty's Day.